Hello there and a very warm welcome to Christchurch Fetcham. You join me in isolation uh, in my bedroom. Um, but we're gathered here today, aren't we, to worship the living God. Even though we're in isolation, even though we're separated from each other, we can all join together. And uh, this is a great time to, to, to sing his praises, to hear his word read and to hear his word preached. Um, we're praising the living God, the God who sustains us every day, the God who created this world, the God who loved us so much, even though we're rebels, even though we've turned away from him, he loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus, who came uh, who came and died for our sins. He gave his life on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, who was then raised up to life because the, the grave, it could not hold him. Uh, and then he was he ascended up to heaven where he, he is right now. He lives right now at the right hand of the Father and he's waiting to come uh, to return with the saints uh, to return to judge the world. And so we, 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 we look forward to that day, but he's holding off. He's holding off because um, he, he wants as many people saved, as many people drawn into his kingdom as possible. And so this morning, that's the God we praise. That's the God whom we're going to sing to. That's a God who we're going to listen to. Um, this morning our sermon is by Will Cockrum, he's a friend of John's, uh, John's going to introduce him in a moment, um, but let's join together, uh, even though we're separate, let's join together and praise God, the living God who is the awesome creator and majesty of this universe, uh, who has all things in his hand, and let's praise him. Heart of my own heart, what 
So we have some soap here, some ordinary soap. So here we go. Got some soap on my finger, and I'm just going to dip it in. Look at that. It all separates. It all runs away from the soap and rolls away. So as you can see, the soap works really well. All it does is goes in and it pushes all that oil away. Now, oil is very tricky to get off, as many people will know. Once you get oil in your hands, uh, trying to wash it off with water doesn't work, and you need soap. And this is some of the mysteries behind soap. It just works. It's amazing. But what is the mystery that God is talking about in this passage? Well, in the Bible, we have a whole Old Testament that talks about a promised one coming. In the beginning, uh, Adam and Eve sinned, and sin and death entered the world. And God kept telling us and promising to his people that he will bring a saviour. And we keep waiting for this saviour. And time and time again, we think there's a person who's turned up who's going to save the, save the day. But every time he turns up, he ends up failing and, and, and falling apart. We have David and Solomon, these men who look so great but, but ended up failing. But then comes one who was promised. And we hear in this, in this Ephesians here, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. It was grace lavished on us through what he did for us. And this is Jesus. That he came into the world. It was God sending his son into the world to be with us, to love us, to care for us, to bring us into a relationship. And this mystery has been there for thousands of years, waiting, waiting, and we are able to look back at the cross and see what Jesus did. But it's not finished. Not only has he already saved us if we believe in him, and he's rescued those who follow him, but there's a time to come when all things, as Ruth mentioned last week, will be brought under him. That all things, it says, in earth and heaven together will be brought under one head, and that is Christ. And that's something to be joyful about, it's something to be happy about. Christ died for us, 
and was risen from the dead to bring us into a perfect relationship with him. And that is a mystery that we will never fully understand until we are there with him. And it's a great mystery that was revealed to us. And it's a glorious, glorious thing to remember. So let's pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent Jesus into this world. Thank you that he was willing to come here onto this earth, on this sinful earth, to live a perfect life, to die for us. That he loved us and cared for us. Uh, I pray that we will remember that, that it was a mystery that has been revealed, and that we should enjoy that. It'll be something that we uh, live our lives around, and that we don't keep living lives thinking we're in charge, we're the boss, when we know that you are clearly in control. You are a God who loves us and cares for us, sent Jesus to die for us, and that he reigns on high, and will reign on high forever, and we will get to live with him, that we are brought into a relationship with that, something we don't deserve, and that you still give. But we thank you for that, Lord, and we pray that you will bless this day that we have together. Although we're separate, that we can still share time uh, in your word and study your word. Amen. Cool. Uh, great. Well, uh, I would like to introduce Will Cockrum of Cookville Baptist Church to all of you at Christchurch Fetchham. He's very kindly uh, sent us a sermon, uh, which he's going to preach for us. Um, uh, whilst I'm on holiday enjoying uh, a bit of sun, which is good. Uh, so thank you so much, Will. Um, really okay. kind of you. Now, Will and I met at, uh, well, first at Cornhill, uh, wow. when we were doing a bit of training on uh, Bible handling skills. And then we also joined each other at Oak Hill Theological College uh, for our, our further theological training. Um, uh, so we've known each other for a little while. Uh, but Will, maybe you could take us back a little bit before that and tell us how you became a Christian. Uh, morning everyone. Uh, I became a Christian when I was about 14 or 15, uh, I think it was. Grew up in a Christian family, uh, knew the gospel. I sometimes say, for those of you who know, understand this, I was a Calvinist before I was a Christian. I was, I was brought up knowing the faith. Uh, didn't really sink down to my heart. Um, but then God used the, the regular means of grace, really, camps and, and Christian friends. And uh, about the age of 14 or 15, I remember coming back from a camp convicted of my sin, and at that point the gospel didn't just logically make sense, it, it kind of emotionally made sense, I realised my need of it, uh, and trusted in Christ, uh, and was baptised, I think it was a year or two, year or two later. Wonderful, so that was what, when you were 15? Yeah, I, actually it was two days, so I need, I need to work out, the, it was two days before September the 11th. Oh right, okay. Uh, okay. I was baptised two days before September 11th, Okay. that's how I remember the date, so that was 2000, and, not 2000, uh, what was 2001, wasn't it? No, oh, what was yeah, 2001? 2001, yeah. 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 So. Great. Um, uh, so yeah, baptized at the age of 15, and then um, still at school, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, off to university, yeah, uh, yeah. and then straight out of university, what were you up to then? So, I did a music degree, uh, it's another thing that John and I have in, have in common. Um, uh, did a music degree, did a university, did a post-university apprenticeship with a church I was in up in St Albans, uh, it's called Spicer Street, it's an FIC church. Did that for a year, uh, um, having been quite involved with kind of ministry stuff whilst at university as well. Uh, and then realised I needed to go and get a job, uh, so went and trained and then worked as a secondary school music teacher and did that for uh, three years. Great. Um, uh, and at that point, uh, I was starting to think, and other people around me were starting to say, you should think about exploring ministry. So at that point, as a bit of a tester, I went and did Cornhill, uh, where I met John, uh, for a year, so full time. Um, a bit of a sink or swim, really, thing. And mm. uh, in the Lord's mercy, I think I didn't, well, I didn't sink, um, and uh, kept just above water. And so at that point, uh, we decided that I would go and what did I do? Uh, I went and started Oak Hill part-time whilst working for Spice Street part-time. Did that for two years and then finished off the degree full-time for the following two years. Great. Uh, and then, yeah, Will, Will and I and a few others, we meet up uh, a couple of times a year to encourage each other, uh, build each other up, sharpen each other. Uh, yeah. So we've stayed in contact. Uh, and then after college, Will, where did you go? So I... Uh, came to be the pastor of Cookville Baptist Church in Mid-Sussex. About 30 uh, minutes south of us, isn't it? Yeah, not far. Basically, you think two-thirds of the way down from Lond London to Brighton, kind of on the A20, 
three. That's basically where we are. Little commuter village uh, in that there's a train station seven minutes drive away in Hayward's Heath. So it's an, an affluent area in lots of ways. Um, but yeah, we've been here for, it'll be four years, four years this summer, because you and I left at the same time. Yeah, so four years this summer. Great. Um, uh, and who do you live with, Will? I live with my one wife and two children. Um, pleased to hear. Uh, Vicky, we've been married for 11 plus years. Uh, <laughs> 11 plus. It's going to be 12 years this July. Okay. Uh, I'm kidding. Yeah, on the 18th of July. <laughs> well uh, and Joel and Olivia. Joel's seven, Olivia's four. And both of them uh, are very much at home at the moment, as is everyone else. Mm. Um, so Joel's at the local primary school and Olivia uh, usually goes to a preschool a couple of days a week. So, yeah. Great. Uh, and you're going to preach from Psalm 121 this morning, is that right? Man, yeah. And this is a sermon you preached a few weeks back at Cookfield Baptist Church. Yeah, so I pre this was the first, you might remember the first Sunday after lockdown <laughs> when everyone was scrambling. I uh, decided to preach Psalm 121, speaking into... Uh, kind of where does my help come from? You know, people are quiet, people are aware that they need help, things that they, secure, yeah, certainties are no longer the case. We looked at, and we, by nature, we looked at other things to help, we look, whether it be the government, to the NHS, to family, to friends, whatever it is, to money. And of course, all those things at that point, and now obviously are, uh, going to be shown to be useless in the face, ultimately, of suffering and death. And so I wanted to, to kind of to address that really, and say, where does our help come from? And of course, the answer in Psalm 121 is our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, I wanted to speak into that. So it was a few weeks ago, but it's very much in the coronavirus context. Yeah. <laughs>
Absolutely join me in a short time of prayer. Dear Lord and God, we do um, pray to you now at this time um, with this coronavirus and with the world in lockdown. Uh, we pray to you because um, as a world, we need your help. We need, we need you to um, fix this problem. And we know that the, the world doesn't want to acknowledge you, even in the midst of this disaster, even in the midst of the panic. The world does not want to come to you for help, Lord. But we would um, bring our petition to you that you would help the world, even though the world doesn't turn to you, Lord, that you would help them as you are a gracious God. And we know you are a gracious God and you can uh, you can heal those things that are uh, difficult to heal. And so, Lord, we pray that um, a, a solution will be found to heal those people who have this virus. And there would be um, you would give skill to the uh, scientists and those working on um, trying to stop this virus. We pray that uh, you would have mercy on us as a people, Lord, that we know um, around the world that uh, the people have turned away from you, that they serve themselves, that they don't acknowledge you or that you are the living God. Um, but you, we pray you would have mercy upon them, Lord, that at this time that they would turn to you in their droves, that thousands of people would get to um, hear your sermons preached online, that they would um, they would have time to stop and think about what life is about and that they would turn to you, the living God, and that they would serve you, Lord, um, as they ought to serve you. And they would see that you are the God who made the world and who, who sustains the world and who is the living God. Lord, we, uh, we pray for wisdom with the government. We pray that they would make the correct decisions, that you would, you would help them to lead the country. You would, um, you would help them to do the right things and to have compassion on those who are weak and who are needy and those who are um, particularly at risk from this virus. Uh, we pray um, that you would help us as a church, Lord, to have compassion on those in need, those who are on their own, those who are isolated, that we would do what we can to help them and to have a compassion as a, as a church, a love for those who are in need and that you would put on our hearts different people who we might reach out to, who we, um, who we might um, think of ways to help, uh, who we might be praying for. And would you help us to be a, a praying church? You would bring before our mind different people who we might pray for and that we would pray for those who are in need. And Lord, we pray for help in proclaiming Christ at this time, that each one of us would think about different ways that we can proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ because this virus has helped to remind us that all life is transient, uh, that life on this planet is short and that people need to know the gospel. They need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do pray, O oh Lord, that you would reach out to those who are lost um, and you would help us to take our part, Lord, that we would think about those who we can share the gospel with and we would um, perhaps we would share it online and um, uh, sermons online or we would. Uh, speak to people over the phone that we would tell them about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation, those who are uh, isolated and lonely. We pray if they are lonely that, that you would um, make sure that people phone them up, that people talk to them. If there's anyone in need that they would let us know that we would um, be able to give them the things that they need at this time. Uh, we pray particularly for Anita at this time who's lost her older brother, we pray that you would be merciful to her, you would give her um, your peace, you would help her to know your presence particularly closely to her at this time. So we pray all these things and bring them to you, Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read Psalm 121, a song of ascent. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. 
The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Father in heaven, please help us as we uh, seek to understand and apply these wonderful truths. Please speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the coming months, uh, particularly as coronavirus spreads around our country, who or what are you going to look to for help? Many of us will look to our money. We would do that in life. If there's a problem, we just throw money at it and it usually goes away in some way. Maybe we'll therefore try to use our money to solve coronavirus or protect ourselves from it in some way. Many of us will look to family for help. Uh, we'll look to, to, to parents, to, to children for help and, and comfort and support, and understandably so on one level. But we'll look to them to, for help in a time of trouble. I guess most of us are looking to our government for help uh, today and in the coming months as they seek to protect us uh, from coronavirus and the spiralling death toll uh, that is expected I guess many of us, buying into our culture, would try to look to ourselves, my own inner strength, own inner motivation um, for help. We look within for help. I guess the problem is that over the coming months, we are going to find that all of those things will let us down. So money. Well, ultimately, coronavirus does not care how much you have in your bank account. The very rich are getting it. The very poor are getting it. The very rich are going to die from it. The very poor are going to die from it. You can't, as it were, keep yourself safe by using your money. It doesn't protect us. I guess uh, that's going to be true for family too. Not that we don't get the love and support uh, that we want and need from family but ultimately there are going to be many families left powerless at home while their loved ones suffer and even die and that's going to be one of the really hard things about the coming months powerless to help of course we look to our government but not even our government can protect us from coronavirus if they could they would just eradicate it from our country overnight and yet they are powerless we're thankful for their expertise, really thankful, but they are unable to protect us, to help us, ultimately, to keep us from suffering and to keep us from death. And of course, as we look to ourselves, well, I can have all the self-motivation that I want, but ultimately that won't stop me getting coronavirus, nor will it stop me from experiencing other hardships. Uh, that will come our way. May, they may be uh, financial hardships, they may be family hardships, things to do with anxiety, depression, all those things. All those things are powerless. They can't stop suffering and they can't stop death. Nor can they get us through death. They're powerless. But in the psalm that I've just had read, that I've just read for us, we are pointed to someone who isn't powerless and who can help. We're just going to look at those uh, words in the psalm. Let me look, read verse uh, one of the psalm. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? The psalmist writes. Well, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so the question I want to explore just uh, for a few minutes now from this psalm is this, this question. Why look to God for help? I think the psalmist gives us uh, three reasons. And the first is there in verses one and two. Why look to God for help? Well, firstly, because he is able to help. I lift my eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. 
what does this psalm teach us about God? It teaches us that he is the maker of heaven and earth, including the hills. It's kind of Bible language for everything, heaven, up, earth, down. And this song would have been uh, sung, it's one of the songs of ascent, and it would have been sung as God's people walked up the hill through the mountains towards Jerusalem, uh, the place of pilgrimage where the temple was. And it would have been a dangerous route. It would have been well known for its bandits and all the rest of it. It would have been a dangerous uh, route to travel. And as the psalmist, as it were, walks uh, through uh, the valleys up to Jerusalem, as he's aware of the danger that he is in, he finds himself asking that question, well, where am I going to look to for help? In the face of danger. Where is going to be my secure, that deep security that allows even us to face the darkest of times? And his answer is, well, the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who made everything. Let's just stop and think about that for a moment. The God who made you and me. The God who made our families, our homes, our government, our money. The God who made every single cell in coronavirus. Think about how powerful God is. He's the creator of everyone and everything. Oh, we are creatures and we are being reminded of that at the moment. We, we are in so many ways powerless. But God, he's not a creature. He's the creator. And so he's not like us. He is powerful and therefore he is able to help us. But here's the question. Yes, he's, okay, he's powerful, but is he able, uh, sorry, is he aware that we need help? So imagine you're experiencing coronavirus in the coming weeks and you're lying maybe in a hospital bed on a ventilator. Is God, does God care about me? Does God care about this? Does God... Oh, he's got aware that I need help? Well, have a look at verse 3. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. So why look to God to help us? Well, because he's able to help us. Secondly, because he knows uh, that we need help. Verses uh, 3 to 4. Uh, you and I need sleep. Sleep is a wonderful gift, isn't it? Uh, especially for those of us with young children. <laughs> we need sleep. But God doesn't. And that is great news for us, actually. Because that means that he is uh, aware of our needs. There are no uh, 3 a.m. missed calls where he needs to sleep and we can't get through. He is aware of everything, even the most intricate things in our lives, even in those darkest moments. He is aware because he never sleeps. He's never asleep at the wheel. He is always awake. But therefore, is, is God like one of those really lazy security guards who stands behind a security camera in a booth somewhere, you know, where he's aware of what's going on uh, and he's able to come and help you, but he just can't be bothered? Well, no. Yes, he's able to help. Yes, he's aware that we need help. But finally, he will help his people. Uh, the you in verses 3 and 4 uh, speaks of Israel, of God's people, um, which in New Testament language is all those who trust in God's promises of salvation. It is all those who trust in Jesus, who have turned from their sin and, and trust in Jesus. And so in verses 5 to 8, the, the, the plural you goes from plural to singular. It's like the choir stops and it becomes an individual word to each individual follower of Jesus. It is a personal promise of help. <coughs> and so in the particular situations that you are finding yourself in, maybe worries about health, about work, about family, whatever it is, verse 5. The Lord watches over you individually. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. So 
a wonderful image, isn't it? Daytime, when things are going well. Moon, uh, the language of, 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 of evil in the Bible, a picture of it. A place of darkness. Whatever happens today and tomorrow, God watches over us to care, to help, to protect. But it's not just in the particular situations that we find ourselves in. Verse 7, it's much more general. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and evermore. You see that? He will help. He will protect his people. Now and forevermore. But I think that leaves us with two big questions. First question. If he's able to help, and he knows that we need help, and he promises to help his people, why do we suffer? Why has God allowed coronavirus to spread through our world, to spread through our nation, to spread into our community, maybe even into our households. Why is God allowing this? That's a huge question, isn't it? And of course, as believers, well, of course, we look forward, don't we? We look forward to a day when Jesus will return, the judge of the living and the dead, and he will take his people to be in a renewed world, a world that, as it were, has gone through the washing machine, where there will be no more sin, no more suffering, no more death, forever. Only joy. Joy in community. Forever. And so we look forward to that. Verse 7, we will be kept from all harm. Verse 8, forevermore. Oh, we look forward to that. And this psalm points us forward to that. But of course, in the here and now, it is true to say that we suffer because God has chosen to allow it as part of his care. And therefore the promise here in this psalm is one of care, help and provision and protection. Not despite suffering, but through suffering. That was true for Jesus when he was here on this world, in this earth. Of course Jesus was, was born and he grew up and he suffered in life. I don't know whether he ever got coronavirus, I doubt it. Not to be flippant, but he would have experienced sickness growing up. He suffered in life. As an adult, he was persecuted. He was marginalised. He knew what it was to feel all alone. He felt that acutely in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus suffered in life. He lost a parent, it would seem. Joseph is not to be seen on the, on the scene in, uh, when we get to the adult life of Jesus. He suffered in life. But the Bible says he also suffered in death. You see, the cross, when Jesus went to die on the cross, that wasn't an accident. That was God's plan. That wasn't plan B, that was plan A. Of course, on one level, people were breaking, of course, they were breaking all sorts of commandments in killing Jesus. And yet, behind it all, God's sovereign plan was that Jesus would go and die on the cross. God allowed it. God allowed Jesus to suffer in death. And on the third day, Jesus rose from death. The firstborn among the, the new creation, Paul says, the first one to be brought through death and out to the other side. There's a sense in which as Jesus came out of the tomb on Easter Sunday morning, he could have been humming and singing to himself Psalm 121. The promise of protection even in the face of death. And for us, well, Jesus says to his disciples, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters. This is Luke 21, verse 16 to 18. You'll be betrayed by relatives and friends and they will put some of you to death. In other words, guys, you will suffer. But, verse 18, even though everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm 
and you will win life. You see that? Oh, you will suffer. But I care about you, even the most intimate parts, the hair. I know everything about you. I watch over you. And I will meet your deepest needs, spiritual needs there of salvation ultimately. And so if you're trusting in Jesus, we need to trust that these words are true. That God is able to help us, that nothing has slipped through the net. Whatever is happening in our lives and to those who we love, God is in control. He is able to help. We need to believe that he knows that we need help. He watches over us. He is aware of everything. And we need to remember that he will help us through tough times. He will protect us. Even through death. We have a wonderful resurrection hope, don't we, as those who are trusting in Jesus. Jesus' death is our death, which we'll think about in a moment. But his resurrection is our resurrection. He has been through the grave and out to the other side. And he promises that he holds us in his hand even as we are laid down into the ground, as it were. He will get us through death. We need not fear it, nor do we need to fear anything, actually. And so as you look to the hills, whatever the hills are for you, where are you going to look to for help? That's a question that searched me this week as I've thought about it and, re and reflected on these words. As I've uh, talked with some of you throughout the week who are, who are really struggling. Look to God for help. Trusting that these words are true. We sing, don't we? God always keeps his promises. And that's true. So firstly, why do we suffer? Secondly, well, how do I become one of God's people? See, our culture, and maybe you think this too, uh, up until now, that being a Christian, being part of God's people, means being good enough. But that is a lie. We can never be good enough. The Bible says that actually, yes, God is the creator, but we have rebelled against our creator. We are creatures who will shake our fists at God. And so even when we suffer, we blame God and we think that he's done something wrong. That it just exposes our hearts. No, and that is why we need a saviour. We need Jesus. We have rebelled against our creator and we deserve his eternal punishment for our rebellion. How dare we shake our fists at our creator and think we can live in his world, trusting in other things, living for other things, living as if he just wasn't there. But that is why Jesus came into this world. You see, what was happening when Jesus died on the cross? Well, on one level, it was the greatest act of evil that has ever been committed. As, as it were, humanity killed its creator. And yet as Jesus was dying on the cross, he was taking the punishment that his people deserve. Our greatest problem is not financial difficulty. It is not our anxiety. It is not anything we might experience off the back of coronavirus or any, anything in life, our greatest problem is our sin and our status before our holy God, which is not neutral by nature, it is hostile. And therefore God is rightly hostile towards us. And that is what Jesus came to solve. As he died on the cross, he took the punishment in our place, making a way for us to be friends with God, to experience his forgiveness, not in the basis of us being good enough. We can't, we can't. Even, our good, even the good things that we do are dripping with false motives and mixed motives. No, we need a saviour who will save us, who will give us the free gift of salvation. And therefore he calls everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, he calls you to follow Jesus, to become part of his family, so that you can call God Father and he will treat you as his children, as one of his children. How do you do that? Well, you stop trying to save yourself. You turn from the sin of thinking that you can live your own way without God. Turn from sin, from the heart attitudes that where we live in rebellion against God. 
we turn from those things and we turn to Jesus as our Saviour and as our Lord. We trust him to hold us fast even through the toughest of trials. Turn to Jesus today. And so can I say, with coronavirus coming over the hills, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you that you are the great creator God. Thank you, Father, that you uh, made all things, that everything in this world, uh, that you made uh, everything that exists. Thank you that you made us. Uh, thank you that you are therefore able to help us. Father, thank you uh, that you watch over this world and you watch over your people. Thank you that you are aware of uh, whatever it is that is going in our lives, going on in our lives at the moment and what is going to happen over the coming months. And thank you, Father, that you promise to help and protect your people through suffering. So, Father, please help us to trust you and to look to you for help even when things are really hard. Father, please, whatever it is uh, that we're facing, whatever uh, kinds of anxieties uh, we face this week, help us to trust you in the very depths of our being, knowing that you are good. Uh, Father, please, when we doubt you, please help us to go to the foot of the cross again, remembering that you have sent us a saviour and that you are able to use even the, the, the darkest depths of suffering for our good uh, and for the good of this world. Thank you, Father, that Jesus is the saviour we need. And we pray, Father, that many more would come to know and love and serve and trust Jesus in this time of trouble. Please, Father, would our nation, uh, as it looks for help, as it realises that these other things don't work, that they, they can't meet our deepest needs, please would our nation turn to you, we pray, in Jesus' name. and free and you me from eternity pulled me out before my birth to bring you glory on this earth grace amazing pure and deep saw me in my misery that took my curse and all my blame so I could bear your righteous name. Grace paid for my sins and brought me to life. Grace clothed me with power to do all his rights. Grace lead me to heaven where I'll see Selfish pride to love the cross on which you died. Grace and ending all my days, give me strength to run this race. And when my years on earth are through, praise will all belong to you. Grace. sins and brought me to life. Grace clothed me with power to do what is right. Grace lead me to heaven where I'll see your face and never see Brought me to 
Right. Great.